Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. And as I'm watching the chat and everyone joining, it's looking like we have a wonderful uh, group of people uh, joining. I see a lot of typing happening. So I'm going to uh, maybe go a little slowly through the introduction, uh, as I know um, folks are joining. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about what we're going to uh, discuss today, and then I will also reach out and ask to hear a little bit about you um, via the online poll. So I will transition to our slides and start the webinar. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Futures Without Violence used to be the Family Violence Prevention Fund. That's how many people know us. We do a lot of work around um, the healthcare system and children exposed to violence and house the National Health Resource Center on domestic violence um, that's funded out of the Department of Health and Human Services. We are based in San Francisco, though we do have small offices in D.C. and Boston. I am in our Washington, D.C. office doing our public policy work. Uh, we were founded now more than 35 years ago. <laughs> it's hard to believe, even for us. Uh, that we, how long we've been doing this work. Um, and as I said, our focus really is around uh, prevention, early intervention. Uh, we do a lot around policy and systems reform and public education and social norm change. And also, like our partners here with NCJFCJ, um, we try to provide as, uh, a lot of technical assistance to the field. So I'm going to try to, as best I can via this format, um, give you the kind of information that you're most interested in I recognize that there may be some gaps based on things that you want to know that weren't uh, known ahead of time. So I really do encourage you to go ahead and use the chat function, um, to use the online web links that were provided, and to absolutely uh, follow up and use the survey provided uh, to give me and us good feedback because we're not doing our job if you're not getting what you need. So I really do uh, emphasize and encourage you um, to tell us how we can be most helpful. Um, and if there are things that were really helpful, um, you know, please share that as well. Thank you. Okay. This is me. Um, I, as was said, I'm the Director of Policy for our DC office. I've been here now uh, 16 years, um, starting next week. Um, and prior to that, I worked on Capitol Hill uh, for a member of Congress from New York. And I handled uh, many of his women's issues, his poverty and civil rights issues. Uh, and importantly, uh, he was a member of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, so I got a firsthand view of how to help uh, get more funding uh, for the kinds of programs that we all uh, need and care about. Um, with that, I would love to hear a little bit about who you are and who's on the call. So I ask you to go ahead and uh, answer question number one, who is here today? Uh, and if you could please uh, click so I know uh, who you're uh, sort of with and you know, what type of organization you represent. And I'll hold on for just a few seconds while folks fill that out. Okay. Well, please do keep filling it out. What I am seeing on the question is that we have a lot of folks from domestic violence agencies. It looks to be about a third of our attendees, um, some educators, folks with the criminal justice system, and folks who do community CCRs, coordinated community responses, and then another good percentage of uh, participants who work uh, within the child support or child welfare systems. Um, so thank you for that. That's um, really helpful for me um, in terms of tailoring the presentation. Okay, an overview of today's presentation. We'd like to uh, you to know what we're going to talk about. The intersections of child welfare and domestic violence with a little overview of children exposed to violence generally. We're going to talk very specifically about CAPTA, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, and what provisions specifically relate to the overlap of domestic violence and child welfare. Futures did a study of states after the passage of CAPTA about how implementation was going, and so we have some results from that. 
And we'll also talk about key recommendations for the future uh, because CAPTA and FIPSA, the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act, which funds many of our local domestic violence shelters, um, both just recently expired. Uh, doesn't mean they're going away, so there's no panic, but it does create an opportunity to, to look closely at them, how they're working, and gather ideas for what might be the best ways to improve them for future years. I also know that many people are interested in how CAPTA might fund joint collaborative work uh, between domestic violence um, and child welfare or child serving agencies. So I will also talk a little bit at the end about other potential um, funding sources or other potential resources that might be available to uh, improve the collaboration and joint work around domestic violence and children, um, and again, also some very just practical issues about where there's some money to do it. <laughs> so just to highlight, child maltreatment report, which is the, the data that child welfare agencies from around the country report to the federal government is kind of our best baseline for rates of child abuse and neglect in the country, um, as well as the criteria or descriptors of you know, who is it that perpetrates, who are the victims, what are the types of abuse and neglect children experience. It gives us our best baseline data. It's by no means perfect, so I never want to say this is definitely the exact amount, um, but it does give us a, a sense of what's happening out there. So uh, child, mal child maltreatment for 2013, um, so that's a slight lag in terms of getting the data collected and reported, shows that about 27% of the victims of child maltreatment in their system, who are children who are identified as victims of abuse or neglect, um, cited domestic violence as one of the risk factors um, for being in child welfare. And 15.4% of child fatalities, according to this data, had domestic violence as a factor. You know, we don't get the exact details um, the way you would in a child fatality report, but it does give you some sense. Uh, now, this is actually a decline from the previous year, and we don't know if that marks a genuine decline or if it's just kind of a one-year anomaly. So we'll continue to look at future year's data. Now, there's a couple important caveats, <laughs> and I emphasize this only because we really like to work closely with state partners about getting states to get better data uh, because that does help us just know how we need to tailor our services and importantly, uh, helps us make the case for why we need to address domestic violence or the other issues that impact um, child abuse and neglect. So importantly, only 30 states report, <laughs> um, and, in, and some of the big states are missing. So for instance, my home state of California um, does not report data on this, which is a, definitely a problem. Uh, and, and by that I mean reporting data on domestic violence specifically as a risk factor. So they do submit child maltreatment data. The other thing that gives us some pause about the full accuracy of that data and how and collecting data around domestic violence is the wide discrepancy among, this, um, among the states um, and also the degree to which the rates reported don't mirror in any way the rates we see at the state level of domestic violence or of domestic violence fatalities generally. For instance, Alabama reports only 1%, I think it's 1.4% of their cases had domestic violence as a risk factor, uh, whereas Michigan cited 50%. And I think most of us on the call probably know that probably it's a little bit closer to 50% than it is to 1%, um, but that we know the data, that, that clearly is a bigger gap than exists in the real world. What we also know when we look at child fatality reports or other very local or state specific reports is that we tend to see domestic violence uh, more often as a risk factor in that child fatality. So it may not be the, the identified cause of the fatality, uh, but it often once you start digging into the situation a little more closely, you realize that there was domestic violence um, in that family, even if it was the perpetrator wasn't necessarily uh, the person who um, murdered the child. But again, when you look at the case, you see domestic violence and understand that it had you address the domestic violence, you might have had a chance to prevent that child fatality. 
We also found an older study, and I, um, I haven't actually seen it replicated, but would welcome if others know of studies that have replicated it, that looked at uh, child uh, welfare case reports and then did um, direct um, surveys or follow-up or information gathering uh, with um, victims of domestic violence who were ha within the child welfare system. And one of the things that they really identified was that child welfare agencies frequently miss domestic violence. Now this is a little bit older, so we'd love to think that uh, systems are getting better at recognizing it, um, but it is important to note that just because you know, what's reported to the system isn't necessarily, again, the objective measure of what's really happening in the world. As I mentioned, the data around the child maltreatment reports don't necessarily match domestic violence rates. Right? Rates of domestic violence in Michigan are not 50 times that of rates within Alabama. Um, you know, we know that. So uh, we recognize that we need to get better at collecting the data and working um, closely between domestic violence agencies and child welfare agencies to be capturing good data. We also know that, uh, according to other surveys that look just at children exposed to violence generally, so not necessarily those that come into contact with the child welfare system, up to a third of children in this country are exposed to domestic violence by the time they're 17. Um, so we know the rates are pretty high, uh, and we know that that is not reflected in our child welfare um, agency numbers. Now, for, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, right, because we don't necessarily need every case of, of domestic violence reported to a child welfare agency. But again, it does give you a sense of, you know, there's a lot happening that's not necessarily brought to the attention of child welfare. Um, we also know, just in looking at the child maltreatment data, that there uh, are a very small percentage of cases involve child sexual abuse. Uh, I'd like to think that that's a good thing and that it means that there's not child sexual abuse happening out there. But again, one of the concerns we have with agencies missing domestic violence, however, is that we know um, there is a higher overlap of child sexual abuse, again, in cases where there's an abusive um, husband, partner, boyfriend, father of the child. So uh, we want to be sure, again, that we're capturing the domestic violence and understanding how it poses a risk to that family. So why domestic violence should matter to child welfare agencies? Um, I think most of this is self-evident, but I am just going to go over it. Um, and obviously, domestic violence abusers are more likely to harm the child directly. Um, we notice a 30 to 50 percent overlap of perpetration of violence against uh, women and partners with uh, violence perpetrated against a child. We know that witnessing the abuser's harm to a parent victim um, can be harmful to the child, right? So a lot of the data we now see, and it, it seems to only increase, show that witnessing domestic violence for children um, can be a very harmful thing. Now, we always like to say children are very different, <laughs> and there's a lot of really good things that mothers do or other families members do or communities do that can mitigate the harm of witnessing domestic violence on a child. So we never want to say that witnessing domestic violence in and of itself is abuse or neglect, but what we do want to acknowledge is that it's still not great for kids, and in some cases it, it can be potentially very harmful to the child if, if not addressed, right? That's the important thing. So knowing about it is about knowing how to address it and knowing how to best support that family, heal, and thrive. We also know that violence can at times compromise the mother's ability to care for and connect um, with her child. There's a lot of good data now on um, bonding, attachment with young children, uh, and we know that mothers who are victims of domestic violence often may struggle more with depression or mental health issues caused by the abuser. Um, there may be more substance abuse. Um, we know some abusers very intentionally um, try to get partners addicted or sabotage their um, so for instance, a recovering addict, they may intentionally sabotage her ability to get clean just as another method of power and control. Right? Those of us familiar with domestic violence know that abusive partners really will use almost all the tools in their tool belt um, to establish control over um, a partner. And so we want to be thoughtful about that as well in terms of its impact on the kids 
and as we think about how to get and how to create a safe environment for that child, understand that the violence may be impacting a mother's ability to be healthy and clean. We know uh, abusive partners will uh, intentionally sabotage uh, someone's ability to go to school, um, be at their job on time, so things like last, at the last minute withholding child care. So all of a sudden she can't, she has to call in sick to work or the child ha or she has to leave the child without child care, right? Often forced to choose between going to a class, going to a job, and you know, the safety and security of the child. And occasionally we see higher rates of harsh parenting um, in families where we know there's domestic violence. The recent uh, commission on child fatality uh, also looked at domestic violence as a risk factor in child fatalities across the country. And the report included this quote, research shows that perpetrators of domestic violence present a risk not only to their spouses or partners, but also to their children in the home. Again, though, I really want to emphasize two really important things um, in terms of what this means for a response, which is that the response in that situation is to hold the perpetrator accountable for their behavior. If it is their behavior that is putting the child at risk, we need child welfare reports, for instance, to document that accurately. Uh, it is not the mother putting the child at risk necessarily. It is the perpetrator. If that's the person who's creating the abuse, we need to document that carefully. We also know that many moms who are, um, are abused are still fabulous, wonderful moms. <laughs> and we need to always remember that and not just go, oh my gosh, if she's in a domestic violence situation, she must not love her children, which I, I feel like we're past that in most cases, but every once in a while I, I do still hear stories um, that people assume that if a mom is in an abusive relationship that it, it must be because she's somehow choosing him over her children. And we know that that's not always the case and almost never the case. So we need to remember that um, moms are often doing the best they can. They may make decisions in a, when they're in a domestic violence situation that to someone who doesn't understand domestic violence um, seem wrong or bad or not protective of their child. So this is why we really encourage good data on domestic violence, right, getting back to that original point, because it's key to helping a mother help keep her child safe and for that child to be safe is understanding the violence, understanding the risk factors associated with it, understanding the protective strategies that she may, may be taking and helping support her um, and that child. Um, we still say the best way to help a mom is to help their child. The best way to help a child is to help their mom. Um, and again, it's not always the mother who's the um, not abusing parent in the cases of domestic violence, so I don't want to always assume that is the case, um, but more often than not it is the mom. So I did a fairly quick overview because I feel like probably this audience already knows much of this and wants to kind of get to the get to the good stuff. But I did just want to ask you to go ahead and fill out the poll um, about whether you would like more information um, on the effects of domestic violence on children, um, either in this session or if you want to just fill something out in the chat. Um, it's also stuff that we can um, follow up on. And I'm, okay. So it looks like we're seeing a lot of folks who actually um, would like some more information on the effects of domestic violence on children. So that's helpful. And as a part of that, what I'm also now going to ask folks to do is if we can move on to the second question that looks at adverse childhood experiences, because that's one of the key studies that talks about the impacts of violence and exposure to extreme adversity on children's development. So if you could fill out that poll as well. Okay, let me see where we are here. 
So this is really exciting for me. So we're looking at about a, a relatively equal distribution of folks who know about the ACES study and use it in their work and people who have never actually heard about it. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is try to find that uh, sweet spot in the middle uh, and give you some information. And then what we'll also do is be sure to do some follow-up um, uh, written email or we'll send you to accurate websites that can give you even more um, details about ACEs and about tools for applying it in your work. So the Adverse Childhood Experiences study was actually started um, by an obesity researcher um, out at Kaiser Permanente, a health center in San Diego. And he started by uh, trying to understand why people in his weight loss program, and these were people who were very severely uh, overweight, were dropping out of the program, particularly the ones who were being successful. Right? He thought, well, that's kind of strange. You would think that the people who are most successful uh, would be the ones who are most excited and want to stay with the program. And in doing that research, he came across other research that said, um, you know, age, and I hate this term, but this is the term at the time, right, that uh, age of sexual debut has an impact on weight, uh, predominantly for women. And so he started asking his uh, clients about um, age of sexual debut, which became one of his standard um, questions. And what he unfortunately and sadly quickly realized was that there was a very high percentage of um, clients who had experiences with child sexual abuse. And he tells this very um, heartbreaking story of you know, his moment when he discovered this of asking a client, um, you know, it was a, a sort of a, a fumble of a question. You know, he jokes, because I'm an obesity person, I always ask people, how much did you weigh when? How much did you weigh when? And he talked about asking this woman, how much did you weigh when, um, you know, your age of sexual debut? And she said 40 pounds. And he went, uh, you know, as he's collecting his thoughts, she says, I was eight and it was my dad. And he had this light bulb <laughs> and he started going, oh my goodness and started asking more clients, dis discovered that about a quarter of his patients had experienced child sexual abuse. And this was a very you know, middle class, insured population in San Diego. Uh, and he didn't even believe his data at first, partnered with the CDC uh, epidemiologist to, to really systematize the screening of questions. And then he started as he was doing this research to start adding in other questions to really try to understand how what happened in childhood impacted people's health as they aged. What's incredibly powerful about this research is because he was a Kaiser physician, he had access to all of people's health information, right, for many, many years. So he knew how many prescriptions they were getting for uh, you know, COPD even. He knew if they were having asthma attacks. He knew if they were managing their diabetes. Uh, he saw, in some cases, whether they died prematurely. And so over the years, this partnership between Kaiser and the CDC, they've documented um, what became kind of the 10, 8, what are known as the ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences, that very powerfully predict health consequences as you age. And so they, it looked at exposure um, to domestic violence, a parent who was incarcerated, having a parent who was, uh, had a substance abuse issue. Uh, and again, exposure to these 10 things, uh, the more of these things that you were exposed to as a child, the more likely it had an impact on your health, including most powerfully uh, rates of addiction, substance abuse, mental health issues. Um, the likelihood of you being an intravenous drug user is just off the charts higher if you have six or more of these adverse experiences than if you have none of them. And what we also know is that, again, child abuse and neglect, sexual abuse, exposure to domestic violence, the loss of a parent. Um, so um, a, a domestic violence situation almost automatically gives you an ACE score of about three or four as a child. What we then also know about domestic violence is that often um, it compromises the ability of, of the non-abusing parent to be as present and supportive for the child who's witnessing the abuse. 
So when we talk about the impacts of traumatic experiences on children, you know, we talk about what's, you know, what's sort of the bad things that are happening, but then on the other side of that scale, you know, what are the good things that are supporting that child's health and sense of safety and sense of healing? And what happens with domestic violence cases, we know, is that it's both this very frightening and scary set of things that are happening um, between the people who are supposed to care for you um, from a child's perspective, and then that often the parent who is loving, and in some cases it is, it is both parents, right? We know um, in many domestic violence cases, the men involved may still very much try and want to be good and loving parents, um, which is can be complicated, even more complicated, right? And so um, we also see that kind of the double whammy, right? So the traumatic event to the child's development without as often the protective, resilience-building, um, supportive environment that could counterbalance some of that trauma. Um, so that's why we know that it, um, domestic violence situations have a, a particularly um, profound impact on children. Uh, they do really challenge the child's sense of safety in the world. What we also know about young children is when you look at developmental milestones, um, often the, one of the things that's most important when a child, for a child to development is to have a sense of safety in the world, right? So children won't try to start walking if they're always scared that when they get, start walking they're going to get knocked down, right? They don't start um, exploring their world if every time they explore their world they're hit or punished. And, that, and you can't kind of get to that next stage. You don't get to running if you don't walk, right? <laughs> um, and so you don't get to reading if you don't talk um, so, or have someone you know, talk to you or interact with you. So these are some of the important effects, and there's some really good data on this that is, um, turns out is actually on the council's um, website as well. They've done a whole set of series on trauma and ACEs. Um, we at Futures Without Violence have that as well. So that's sort of a quick response, um, and then with that, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next uh, set of uh, slides. Okay. So now we're going to get specifically to CAPTA, which is the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. So CAPTA was um, passed first in 1974, um, way, way back, um, with the goal of being the nation's sort of first law on preventing child abuse and neglect. This is when the issue, this issue really first um, came into light as a public um, issue. Honestly, before then, and I'm not saying that the law necessarily shepherded this, but before that time, we had a very different view of parents' um, rights over their children. And so this was the, our first really iteration as a country into thinking about, you know, it's not, maybe it's not okay to abuse or neglect your children. It's also really important to know that most cases of child abuse, and I'm putting that in air quotes, are really neglect, about three quarters of the time a parent is charged with abuse or neglect, it's really neglect. And often that neglect is their ability to provide supervision, their ability to provide safe housing. Um, it's not necessarily because someone is, is physically abusing the child. CAPTA was last reauthorized in 2010 along with FIPSA. And as I mentioned earlier, it expired in 2015, which doesn't, again, mean it goes away. It does mean, though, that we have an opportunity to assess how it's been working and to propose some changes to make it better. Core elements of CAPTA, as I mentioned, it is the main federal law on prevention of child abuse and neglect. It is much smaller than what we call 4E and 4B, and those are the sections of the Social Security Act that oversee um, the child welfare system, and they are much, much bigger, and they are largely about funding uh, foster care. That's honestly the biggest chunk of the money in the child welfare system. And unfortunately, not nearly as many services for parents, I think, as many people would like, though I have some good news on that front. And really, just to give you a sense, it's about $7 billion in the system um, that's about uh, addressing violence after the fact <laughs> um, versus the $94 million that goes into CAPTA, and really only about half of which is about true prevention services, and the other half is a lot about um, funding a, a, the child you know, uh, investigation, response, and services. 
It includes basic state grants, so just formula grants. If there's this many people in your, you know, every state gets this amount of money, and if there, if you have more people in your state, you then get a proportion of the funds based on that number of people. Um, discretionary grants, so these are grants that states need to apply to to get additional money to do child abuse prevention. And then community-based prevention grants, and these go to state agencies. Um, or in many states, it's the um, Children's Trust Fund uh, distributes the community-based prevention grants. And these often go out to community-based organizations um, to try to do more prevention-related activities. So some of you may get some of those grants. So during the last reauthorization of CAPTA in 2010, there were some changes made around addressing domestic violence. So one was a requirement that HHS, um, that's the Department of Health and Human Services, disseminate information on effective programs, practices, and training resources related to domestic violence in the child welfare um, context. This, um, this was distributed via the Child um, Information or Child Welfare Gateway, which is an online resource um, put out by the Children's Bureau. Um, we, I will say very honestly, um, have encouraged them to be a little more uh, helpful and proactive. Um, I feel like one sort of fact sheet on a website isn't necessarily um, providing the best information out there. So that's something that I know um, the council tries to work on. It's something that I know we at Futures try to work on, and it's something we've really pushed the agency to try to do a little more in, about creating proactive technical assistance. CAPTA also requires HHS to collect information on incidents and characteristics of child maltreatment and domestic violence co-occurrence. And this is one area where we feel like they're kind of falling down on the job. <laughs> I gave you that data around child maltreatment 2013. Now, the 2014 report did not actually even report out the domestic violence rates. Um, so that's something that we're really pushing HHS uh, to pressure the states to do. But it's something that we would also really encourage um, you who are working in the states and, and doing the, the honest to God actual work of, <laughs> of this um, to really try to push your state child welfare agency to um, collect better data on domestic violence and then to report it clearly so we can be more creative about solving this issue and helping families experiencing both. What it also does, and I think this is probably why uh, many people are excited about it, is it authorizes um, training and technical assistance to providers of mental health, substance abuse, and domestic violence prevention services with regard to child tra maltreatment, which means CAPTA money can go to do DV services, um, and that's important. It also authorizes, that means, so authorizes means they're allowed to do it, but it's not a requirement, right? So the first one was a requirement. These last couple are allowed to use this money to do this service. But it means that you as advocates need to go ask. <laughs> um, unless you're um, blessed to be one of those states where the leadership is really proactive, it, it may mean you as an advocate need to go say, hey, I know CAPTA authorizes us to do this DV work. Um, we need to start allocating some of those resources to do domestic violence or child welfare collaborations. And then, as I said, it also authorizes collaborations and services between DV agencies and child welfare. So, for instance, having a domestic violence advocate within a child welfare agency could be supported by CAPTA dollars. And then it also finally provides, um, the last change was uh, research on what are good collaborations between CPS and DV services. For instance, we've looked at What's better? Is it better to have a domestic violence advocate that actually every day is in a child welfare agency uh, and is actually becomes an employee of the child welfare agency? Is it better if they stay an employee of the domestic violence agency? Um, or is it better if you have um, what we call sort of domestic violence expertise on call so that you have a consultant who could come in and provide case consultation? Um, but isn't necessarily an employee of the Child Welfare Agency. Those are some of the models that states and counties have used, and we'd love to know more about if there seems to be better outcomes with one model over the other. The preliminary research seems to suggest that, it, you know, that magic research answer, it depends, <laughs> um, but that the, the far bigger issue we've discovered is that it's about having access to expertise 
um, that is readily available. And depending on how confidentiality works um, in your um, district or state, whether you want the DV expertise to be an employee of a DV agency or an employee of the Child Welfare Agency um, really is best worked out on a local basis. So that's just a little hint <laughs> of, of that work. Uh, we at Futures then uh, did an evaluation in 2014. Um, you know, it wasn't really something that we had um, serious funding to do, so it, I, I can't say it's an authoritative research study. It really was an online survey um, of child welfare agencies. You know, we did our best to, to recruit the people who would know and then to do some follow-up to try to check back if what they said was true. Um, and we, as I said, we did these um, follow-up interviews um, to also check with federal agencies, the child welfare administrators and policy experts to also see if what got said on the surveys you know, seemed to um, consistent with their own knowledge and experience. And then we also reviewed federal documents and resources. What we found, and again, it was about, about half the states responded. So that already tells you this is only the world according to half the states. Many said that they were aware of the domestic violence provisions. Um, only about 20% of the states said their efforts around addressing domestic violence were a result of CAPTA. They identified co-locating services as the most promising practice. So 60% of states report that they have co-located a DV specialist in their agency. But that still tells you that 40% haven't. And our guess is that the states who were probably doing something were going to be the ones most likely to respond positively. Um, so we do worry a little bit that the states who aren't responding, partially why they're not responding is because they aren't doing anything and they don't necessarily want to report that. HHS, so the Department of Health and Human Services, again, is, some, is trying to improve that response. Um, Commissioner Rafael Lopez uh, himself, uh, a child, um, grew up in a home with domestic violence, that, which he talks very publicly about uh, as really informing his understanding of um, you know, the issue from both sides, that it can be quite harmful, but to also understand that often the agencies that go in to help um, when they don't understand uh, domestic violence, they don't always make the best decisions relative to child safety, permanency, and well-being. And so he tries to bring that awareness to his work. Um, I know he's um, working on a memorandum to go out to child welfare agencies about, again, some best practices uh, and information that can help improve outcomes for kids and families. Um, Fifteen states are, again, are using um, grants to focus on this intersection. Um, there also is the National Resource Center um, for Child Abuse, the, National, so the Children's Bureau Resource Center, um, also is trying to put out resources and technical assistance. Uh, despite the progress, as we said, there still is, are some challenges. Um, to that point that I brought up earlier, CAPTA authorizes money to be spent, but it doesn't mandate it. And I, so I think one of the things that we're considering is some sort of uh, whether we want to try to move to mandating um, improved response to domestic violence um, and whether um, there's a percentage required or whether there's a certain amount required once appropriations reach a certain level, um, we're still thinking about. Um, but there is a concern that unless it's a mandate, it won't get done. Um, there's not enough money. Uh, as you saw that imbalance, you know, the overwhelming majority of the money goes to pay foster uh, families, and while we all want good, strong foster families and, and systems in place for kids who do have to be removed, every, just about I think everybody top to bottom believes that ideally we can keep children with their families, and particularly in cases of domestic violence, often it is, there is a parent who is very willing and capable <laughs> of loving and caring for that child if you could address the violence, and that often means addressing the perpetrator. Um, so if you understand it better, you can address it better. We still don't have the data we need. Um, child welfare is dealing with a lot of competing priorities. Uh, you know, whether a, a parent is also experiencing substance abuse or depression, um, that also clearly has an impact on the ability to care for that child, whether she is homeless. Um, while technically a parent should not lose custody of their child because of poverty, um, we know that so much of uh, 
children are removed from their home because of a parent's inability to you know, provide safe supervision or housing, um, which is very often about um, poverty more than anything else. And we want the child welfare system to address that too. Um, often, again, a, a webinar doesn't always do it. Um, as much as I think they're fabulous, of course, and thank you all for being here, I, my guess is many of you will take information and then have a lot of questions um, that you would like individual help answering or will need, you know, would love personal assistance and you know, how do I make this work in my particular agency? Um, so, um, you know, we certainly will try to help with some of that, um, but we know right now the current resources, you know, don't provide uh, funding for, to help every domestic violence or child welfare agency around the country. I think we talked largely about this, um, where states are addressing it through co-location, training, relationship building, other funding. Uh, for those of you who know about the Victims of Crime Act, and if you don't, um, please, act, uh, please ask, because the Crime Victims Fund uh, received uh, triple funding these last two years, and this is money that goes directly to states to help meet the needs of victims of crime. And we've seen that um, many uh, places around the country are using um, funding from the Crime Victims Fund to fund uh, ch children's advocates, for instance, within DV programs. So uh, we see this is a new pot of money that's specifically to meet the needs of victims of crime. Um, domestic violence and child abuse are two areas that are specifically identified in the law as priority uses for the fund. Um, so that is a source of immediate potential funding um, in your state where there's actually been an increase in funds, which we can't say that about most things. Um, many of you might know about differential response or alternative response. And this is this idea that um, a child, a family may need help. I mean, ideally, our child welfare system is one that, you know, most, that is about helping and supporting families. That's why most people go into child welfare. <laughs> it really is about caring and loving kids and supporting their families. Um, and so uh, this new approach really uh, lets child welfare agencies make, many would argue, better decisions that are more tailored to what's going on with a particular family. So they don't necessarily need to come into the system uh, in a way that's more threatening, but really is a way that um, how do we support this family. So instead of being you know, shifted, it's kind of sort of two tracks. So you go in, the, the situation is addressed, and then you can go into sort of this alternative response track, which is really about how do we you know, often, how do we help this family find stable housing? How do we help you know, repair the car because she could get the kid to school on time every day if she just had a new set of tires? You know? So things like that often are much better addressed through alternative response and not bringing a mother in through this whole investigative process. Um, and then we talked about ACEs. So folks are doing a lot of training around ACEs within the domestic violence and child welfare agencies. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, to put in, it wasn't necessarily the topic, but it is the thing we often get asked about, is are there things that we know work um, to help uh, meet the needs of kids um, in domestic violence situations and also that help um, mothers or parents um, thrive um, in caring for their children, um, even if they are in a domestic or have been in a domestic violence situation. So we at Futures Without Violence have, uh, are funded by HHS to identify um, promise, uh, good programs, um, specifically from the domestic violence side. So these are programs that work in domestic violence cases um, that are supportive of moms and um, children and dads too, um, in many cases. So this is, if you go to the Promising Futures website, and that's also in the web links um, on, that you'll see on your screen, um, is the Promising Futures website that ha lists a lot of very specific programs, what age group they're for. Um, it also does something that I love, just to take a moment to brag on my colleagues, um, is that it really tries to break down in the most basic terms um, what kids need within a domestic violence um, program setting. And some very specific, you know, take all the research we know about ACEs and trauma and sort of how do we translate that into, you know, what do you do when a mom comes in with her three kids at one in the morning? <laughs> and, you know, what can you do immediately? How do you set up your program? 
Um, you don't need to be, you know, a licensed therapist with, you know, a college degree and two years of um, graduate work, right, to, to better meet the needs of kids. Um, and so there are some good programs that are at sort of the lay provider level, and, and absolutely there are some um, therapy-based programs as well. So we list those. And then what we also know is there's a California clearinghouse on evidence-based um, programs, and I included that link in this slide as well. We strongly encourage you to look there too. Uh, we know that almost every, all of us are being asked um, to, to use evidence-based programs or practices. Um, we also like to talk about evidence-informed practices. Uh, not every good program, though, has been evaluated. And many of the programs that really are culturally based, which we often think are frequently the best programs, um, aren't also necessarily haven't had the rigorous evaluation that would kind of bump them up to that evidence-based uh, program status, but that they may still be very good. So we don't want to lose those entirely. Um, you know, other things that we found, I feel like we've kind of addressed this. You know, we don't quite have the data collection. Um, we know there's still real challenges between domestic violence and child welfare agencies. Um, we know funding is particularly lacking in the rural areas. Um, we see a lot of child welfare agencies asking us um, you know, as we, as domestic violence agencies do work with child welfare agencies and say, instead of blaming mom for his violence, why don't you hold him accountable? Many child welfare agencies say, great, okay, how do I do that? And, and really, how do I help him get better? Because <laughs> that's what we all want to do. And we want the violence to stop. Ultimately, that's everybody's goal, is that we want the violence to stop. And there's a real lack of these programs. Uh, I think there's real mixed views on better intervention programs and their effectiveness. I never want to say they never work. Um, that is the, the feeling among some domestic violence advocates. Um, but bad ones don't work. <laughs> and often court-mandated 12-week programs don't necessarily work. Uh, it has to, when they work, they're usually longer term and they're usually because the person who's used violence you know, wants to change and is going to invest in that change effort. So um, we need to, um, you know, we as an organization, I'll say, have sort of moved to saying we need to do a better job with the men. Uh, and, you know, he's an abuser, he's never going to change, get him out, is actually not a particularly good solution. <laughs> and it's what moms have told us. Um, and so that's just one area where we, we would love to think through with our DV colleagues um, around the country um, about um, maybe investing a little more in the men um, and, and helping them sort of heal and thrive and be nonviolent. Okay. Here are some of the other recommendations um, we are looking to make around CAPTA that will improve this intersection around child welfare. You know, we want to not have a child pulled from a home simply because a box is checked somewhere that says domestic violence. Uh, we want there to be well-trained staff who know how to do a good assessment, who understand safety and documentation. Um, West Virginia, for instance, has done a very good job, um, based on our understanding, of um, kind of creating another category. So where you know they may decide to um, bring the child into the welfare system or even potentially remove the child, but they have kind of a no-fault um, cate categorization, I guess, so that um, the records show that it's not that this mom was abusive and neglectful um, because we don't want her, you know, blame prohibited from getting jobs, for instance, because she's a child abuser. Um, yeah, ideally, we don't have the child removed in, at, unless it's the absolute last resort in a very dangerous situation. Um, but you know, states are innovating to try to not necessarily make DV, again, an automatic child abuse, but rather to help workers assess safety. Um, again, we want states to know better, to know and use better protocols. Some are just Fabulous. I mean, there's just fabulous creativity. There are these passionate child welfare workers working with these passionate domestic violence advocates who are really making um, very hard situations much safer and better for families. 
Um, what we know is that, that the work and the innovation that's happening at the local level um, isn't always um, getting out. <laughs> yeah, something that we certainly try to do, but we'd love for there to be more funding and more opportunities um, to share across the country innovative practices. Um, other recommendations we make from a policy standpoint, um, Title IV-E, I don't know if you remember me saying that that's sort of the, one of the big chunks of money. Um, they have to do state plans about what they're going to do with the money. So we think about, we would encourage advocates at the state level to suggest that as part of the state planning process, um, states are required to adopt best practices and policies around domestic violence cases. There's also other programs like the Court Improvement Program to try to use some of those funds to do domestic violence training. Um, fostering Connections is another law that can incorporate domestic violence training into foster care placements. And then health care reform. Um, we know there are now provisions in health care around early screening and assessment that can identify exposure to violence um, before it ever reaches the child protection system. And I can certainly talk about that a little more at the end. So if, um, if folks, uh, I'm about to wrap up. If folks end up wanting to use our last five minutes or so to talk about healthcare um, responses, I'd be happy to do that. Um, we also have additional resources I can direct your way to. Um, some of the regulatory reforms we've talked about, I think similar data collection, evaluation, training in TA, it should sound familiar. Um, the Child Welfare Information Gateway I mentioned is a good resource for you to use. Um, one recommendation we make to advocates is to try to get domestic violence included in the child family service reviews. Um, and these are measures, the idea, these are when state child welfare systems are evaluated and then have to go through improvement. Um, so they're evaluated and then they have to do these PIPs, which are improvement plans. You know, can we get, um, if the data show that DV is not being addressed well, could we get addressing domestic violence included in the plans? Um, I think the other things I've largely talked about already. And again, I think I've touched on most of these issues that federal leadership needs to address it, that we need good data and technical assistance, uh, and that the captive provisions can help, but we really do need funding. I, this idea that we're going to ask agencies to do more partnership, to do more meetings, to do more best practices. Um, you know, most of, most of us, most of you out there I know, um, we all want to do the right work and we don't always have enough hours in the day um, and hours and that often means we need more staff and we need more training and we just need more time um, to do good partnership work. It takes time um, to make systems work well together and we know that um, can be tied to funding. Another area I did not want to leave without flagging, if you don't already know this, there is currently a grant out right now. Um, it's, a, it's a tight squeeze if you don't already know about it, but it's not an impossible squeeze. Um, that there is a new grant program that was included in FIPSA. So as I mentioned, when CAPSA was reauthorized five years ago, it was reauthorized with FIPSA. And FIPSA included a new children's program. Because the idea at the time, right, was that they were going to go together. So FIPSA, which is Funds Domestic Violence Agencies, had a new children's program. CAPTA, which largely addresses child abuse prevention, had a new domestic violence program. The idea was that they would, they would go in tandem, so each system had resources to work together um, and do their own system-specific work and then also the joint work together. So there's funding right now for 10 to 12 demonstration programs. Um, through FIPSA, here is the grant announcement, and it really is about expanding the capacity of domestic violence coalitions and local programs to address domestic violence, um, and really about preventing future domestic violence by addressing the needs of children exposed to violence. So I encourage you to go um, look at that as a potential funding source. And then, as I also said, there's um, I wanted to sort of flag it out there um, to, as a please go look or uh, let, let us find another time to talk again about uh, how to use healthcare transformation and the Affordable Care Act as a means to get services um, for children exposed to violence um, or traumatized moms or children the help that they need. Um, right now, most children in America have health insurance. Um, and increasingly, almost all moms 
do or should. <laughs> um, and within that, there are requirements that um, of health insurers that they have to screen. They don't, I'm sorry, they don't have to screen women, but if they do um, screen, that they can't charge anyone for doing domestic violence screening or services. And so you see a lot more healthcare systems now um, asking women and assessing for domestic violence and wanting to provide services for domestic violence. And what we're seeing is that a lot of times domestic violence agencies are the far better provider of services for victims of domestic violence. Uh, and so we, are, um, we have identified resources. We have them on our website. Happy, again, to do follow-up via um, this webinar on tools about working, creating health care and domestic violence agency partnerships um, that can meet the needs of both children exposed to violence um, and, their adult, and the adults. Um, for children specifically, there is something called um, it's EPSDT. I feel like I'm in DC, I have to speak an acronym, but it's the Early Periodic Screening, Diagnostic, and Treatment Program. You don't really need to know that. What you do need to know is that every child on Medicaid, every child on Medicaid, um, regardless of whether your state expanded Medicaid, um, is allowed to get a paid for assessment of anything that they need <laughs> um, in terms of um, their optimal health and to have the services paid for. Right? So we often see kids who, who may, um, you know, the kids that come to our attention, right? Not all kids exposed to domestic violence, but the kids that are coming to attention in our system are often kids that may be struggling. And so through EPSDT, all of them who qualify are entitled to get an assessment for what's going on and access to the services. And for some, um, uh, recently there was a decision made that children's health insurance can now cover um, maternal depression screening um, and, and potentially services for moms who may be depressed. Um, we know there's a, a real challenge for new moms, even in the healthiest and happiest of homes, um, to suffer from depression um, around the birth of their child. Uh, we know, again, where there's violence, the rates are often higher. And so now here's another tool um, for getting moms help and kids help, um, and also funding some of the best programs that serve moms and kids together, such as um, parent-child psychotherapy. Again, it's a therapeutic program, so for kids and, and moms who maybe need a little more intensive help um, beyond what um, a good advocate um, provides every day. Um, there's also strategies for helping um, domestic violence agencies get uh, paid um, to do some of this work directly, either through reimbursement from the state directly or through developing healthcare partnerships. So um, given our time, I just wanted to flag that um, and let you know about um, resources that are out there or that we can follow up with you on. And that is me. And I, I think I was a bad presenter and didn't leave a lot of time for questions. I hope you were perhaps asking them um, along the way. Um, but please do uh, jump in with the chat um, if there's something I can answer for you in the next couple minutes. Um, or uh, do the survey follow-up, and it's something we can certainly uh, get back to you on offline. Thank you so much, Kirsten. This is Melissa again. As you all are going ahead and entering any questions that you have into the chat, I'd also like to follow up and say that you, those of you that said you would like more information on the effects of domestic violence on children, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges actually has a packet that we put together. It's, it's a little bit outdated insofar as it was put together a long time ago, but it still has a lot of helpful information. So if you would like that packet, you can call our Resource Center at 1-800-527-3223, or you can email us and ask for that information at info at rcdvcpc.org. And Alicia is typing those, that number and that email into the chat box right now. Um, we also have a lot of information on the Resource Center for Domestic Violence, Child Protection, and Custody website. That link is included in your list of web links. And there you can access our, and sign up for our um, twice a year 
uh, newsletter that we send out, which is called Synergy. Um, and our last Synergy issue, published just about a month ago, actually talks about CAPTA, ACEs, evidence-based practice, and collaboration, a number of the issues that Kirsten touched upon today. So if you'd like to receive that newsletter or sign up for our um, biannual newsletter, please go to the website and do that. Um, and we also, I, I mentioned in the chat box, but for those of you that missed it, we held a webinar last week on parenting after trauma. And that webinar talked a bit about ACEs as well. So we're hoping that that webinar will be up and running on the Resource Center website within the next week. So please take a look there if you're interested. And I just have one question, Melissa, about what um, the packet is called. The packet is actually called Effects of Domestic Violence on Children. All right, thank you all so much for attending today. Please feel free to peruse the website. There's a lot more information available. And contact us if you need anything else. And I, we would love the survey as well, because we would love that your feedback. I would really like to hear if it was helpful and what we could do to improve it in the future.